broadcast ministry of Calvary Chapel Birmingham in beautiful Alabama. I am so glad you've chosen to join us as we explore the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Through this ministry, we are reaching thousands around the world with the amazing, exciting, and life-changing Word of God. To learn more about Calvary Chapel Birmingham and God's plan for your life, or how you can partner with this ministry, go to calvarybirmingham.com. Today, God has an extra special message just for you. So grab a cup of coffee, pull up a comfy chair, open your Bible, and let's dig in. thank you for this morning and we thank you for your love your grace and your mercy that you pour out so abundantly in our lives lord in no way are we deserving no way have we merited that lord it is by grace that you have uh, placed those things on us lord father we want to hear from you this morning we ask that uh, that you would just speak to our hearts um, lord that you would challenge us in ways that you would encourage us in ways, that we would find exhortation, and Lord, that we would also um, find just huge heapings of your love for us in this word. Lord, prepare our hearts to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Romans chapter 1. An incredible book, Romans is. And we're going to be today slowing down a bit we're you know we've been taking kind of a a somewhat brisker pace going through the book of acts sometimes we even did uh, a full chapter at a time but with the book of romans there's just so much here um, that that i foresee us spending more time um, within sections of verses rather than sections of chapters or a few chapters at a time Um, And we're going to do that this morning. We're really going to focus in on Paul's introduction here and spend probably all morning here in this introduction piece. We're going to be talking about qualifications some. We're going to be talking about credentials some. There was a man that went for an interview at a police office. There were a handful of people. There were about three there interviewing for this position. And the interviewer said to the first man, he said, the job that you're applying for requires some powers of of observation. So take a look at this picture and make an observation about this man. So each applicant, as they came into the room, they were being shown a picture of a man in profile. The first applicant, he goes into the room and he looks at that picture and profile and he says, well, my observation is this, that man has just one ear. Interviewer says, get out, get out, what are you doing here, get out. The second applicant enters and he says, this man has only one ear. And he says, get out, go, who, who brought you guys in here, get out of here. Third applicant goes in for the interview, but before he gets in the room, the other two applicants, they catch his attention and they warn him saying, hey, that guy that's giving the interview, he doesn't like to hear that the man only has one ear. So the guy said, well, thanks for the heads up. And he walks in and the interviewer says, tell me an observation that you can make about this man. And, and he says, this man in the profile picture He wears contacts. The interviewer's like, wow, that's that's some great observations. You you must really be qualified for this job. How about that? He says, how? How how can you tell this man only wore contacts? The guy said, well, this man has just one ear. How can he wear glasses? (laughs) Qualifications. Qualifications are an important part of finding employment. And so job interviews are often to discover um, if a candidate is actually qualified for the work or not. Now when it comes to salvation, 
There's one qualification, and that is that you're a sinner. That means everyone is qualified, right? However, once saved, we should desire to serve our Lord. And service to our Lord requires credentials. Now, I think there are many believers who feel they lack the credentials to serve God effectively. And that's not true. What are those credentials? We're going to find that out today. The goal of our study today is threefold. First, we're going to introduce ourselves to this book of Romans that we are now entering into. Secondly, we're going to introduce ourselves to Paul's credentials for ministry, which he presents us with immediately as we go into this book. And third, we're going to consider our own credentials in that light. Now, that might sound kind of daunting, you know, looking at our credentials in the light of Paul's credentials, but it's really not. In fact, you're going to be blessed and encouraged by what you learn. There have been, over the years, there have been several authors who have set out to disprove the facts of Christianity. Um, You're probably familiar with some of these books that have been written. I think The Case for Christ was one of them, The Case for the Bible. Books like that where they set out not believing and, and, and they decide, hey, I'm going to investigate everything I can about the Bible, and, and I'm going to prove that the Bible is untrue. And then through the course of that investigation, they become convinced that the Bible is in fact true. And that's what the book ends up being about. Well, they also have attempted to find fault in Paul, in the life of Paul, in his letters, and in the way he lived, um, because while we might not be surprised that somebody would want to prove Jesus wrong or prove Christianity wrong, we might be a little bit surprised but that someone would spend their time trying to find fault in the Apostle Paul. You know, Jesus was the focal point of the gospel. The focal point of, of Scripture is Jesus. Yet Paul, he played a very important uh, role. He was perhaps the greatest missional advocate of the gospel He expressed very clearly in all his letters the doctrines and the theology of salvation by grace through faith. It's very important. And while Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, Paul was commissioned by Jesus in Acts 9.15 as his chosen instrument to carry his name before nations, kings, and the children of Israel. Now, additionally, much of the New Testament is composed of the letters, the writings of Paul, including the one that we are beginning in our study of today. Now, if you've been following with our study in the book of Acts, and if you haven't, you can go back and listen to those. Those are available in iTunes as a podcast. But if you've been, if you've been following with our study through the book of Acts, then you know that the letters of the New Testament, as we have them in our Bible, are not in sequential order. They're not in the order that they were written. Instead, the way that the books were kind of conglomerated into the New Testament after the Gospels was according to author first and then according to the length of the letter. This is why we have Paul's letters with Romans, the longest letter, all the way to, to, through to Philemon. And Philemon was the shortest of Paul's letters. So we start with the, the longest when we go to the shortest. And we find that pattern uh, in the epistles in our scriptures. Now, the, the letter to the Hebrews, that's, that's kind of a bit different because nobody is really sure who the author of that book was. Some say Paul. Um, I've, I've heard somebody propose Luke may have been, although that doesn't quite sound like something that Luke would have written considering how it gets into the Jewishness of, of everything. But also um, Barnabas has been kind of thrown out there as a possible author. I lean towards Paul. Um, there's some, some keys in the book of Hebrews that kind of, uh, I think, reveal that, that Paul was probably the author of that book. But it, there's, there's no named author in that book. Many of the books, you know, they have a, a beginning in which the author of the book talks about their qualifications, like Romans does here. Now, After Hebrews, you know, we have Paul's letters, we have Hebrews. After that, the rest of those letters follow the same pattern, except for uh, the book of Revelation, which is about end times, and it's at the very end of of the Bible, and and very much rightfully so. 
Now, of Paul's letters, they fall into this order if we were to look at them sequentially. There would be Galatians. And these are the letters that we saw as we were studying through the book of Acts. We saw where and what time Paul wrote these letters. Um, and so during Acts, during the, the book of Acts, Paul wrote Galatians. That would have been 40, 40, somewhere in 47 to 50 A.D. Find that in Acts chapter 13. Is, it would have been around the time that he would have written that. Followed by 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And we'll have them up there on the screen for you guys. Uh, Romans. And then, after Acts ends, we have the rest of Paul's letters. Colossians, Ephesians, Philemon, uh, Philippians, and 1 Timothy. All right, so that would be the sequential order, the order in which these letters were written. All right, oh, Titus and 2 Timothy as well. Now, as we studied through Acts, we did point out approximately when Paul would have written those letters, and those, those chapters and all are up there on the screen um, and I think Brandy could just kind of flip around back and forth if you're taking notes so you can look at that. Um, now, I want to remind you that the Bible does tell us in 2 Timothy that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so when we're talking about Paul's writings, which I'm likely to say this letter was written by Paul, um, we've got to understand that, that Paul, Paul was inspired by the hand of God. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit to pen these words. So the Bible is made up of 66 books written by 40 different authors, all by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We find many different styles of writing in the Bible. Um, we find historical styles, uh, poetic, dramatic, uh, genealogical, um, philosophical, parable, prophecy, proverbial. We find epistles as we're studying now. Um, apocalyptic, Revelation would be an example of apop apocalyptic literature, uh, the book of Daniel. Paul's writings are often referred to as epistles, so if you hear that word, if I happen to use that word, I'm just, it's another word for letter, right? So it's this fancy word for letter. Um, and, and Paul's letters, he wrote them um, to either individuals or sometimes to, the whole, to whole churches. And normally what would happen would be Paul would write a letter, he would send somebody to take it, and on their way they would stop at the churches that Paul had planted on the way, and as they went by, those churches would read that letter until it made it to the church um, that Paul wrote that letter to. So everybody was learning from these writings. Everybody was gleaning from these writings um, as they were passed around from church to church. Now because they are letters, we find Paul's writings to be at times personal. We find it to be warm, um, sometimes confrontational. A lot of Paul's writings can, can be downright confrontational, right? Paul was probably an interesting man to sit down and have a conversation with. He had no problem rebuking apostles. <laughs> he, he rebuked Peter. And if, if there was something in your life that, that he saw that, that didn't jive with following Jesus, you can bet Paul was going to tell you what it was. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. It doesn't happen a lot anymore, but it's a very good thing. And it's something we need to be able to do with one another. So they were passed around from church to church, and they, their personal writings, we, we can sense a little bit of, of Paul's personality in these writings. Now, every book of the New Testament is important in its own way. Each letter affirms and upholds the others. Paul's letter to the church in Rome is unique among all the epistles in that it was written to the church that was at the center of the known world at that time. So that, and, and he wrote it to that, to that church so that its great gospel message would go out into all the known world. Now, that church, the church in Rome, I believe, as you guys remember as we studied in, in Acts, I believe that Paul planted that church. But he didn't do it the way that he normally planted churches. Remember, Paul would go from city to city, usually to the large uh, city area, the largest city in the area. He would go there, and he would preach the gospel. People would receive Jesus. He would take those people, and he would put them together as a church body. And then he would continue to, to minister to the church. Sometimes he would leave, go to another place, start another church. And then eventually his next missionary journey, he'd make it back around and, and continue doing that and continue encouraging the churches in that way. 
Now, the, the church at Rome, he did something a little bit different. What he did with the church in Rome is Paul assembled believers together and sent them to Rome. He sent the church to Rome. And that church was founded there. And so this is the letter that was sent to that church in Rome. And we find in this letter that some of it's personal because Paul knew the people that were there, but there were also people he wouldn't have known, new converts to Christianity. Um, and, and so he really spelled out the whole Christian life in this book of Romans. It's amazing all the things that we find in this book. It is incredibly thorough. So to, it was to this church in Rome this letter was written, and, and it is a great gospel manifesto. It's a declaration within it. It declares the righteousness of God. It has great themes of condemnation, of justification and sanctification. We find Paul addressing Israel in her past and her present and Israel's future restoration, including the relationship of the Christian to Israel grafted in. Finally, we have Paul addressing Christian duties and Christian liberties. There's no other epistle that's like this one that so, has so much depth and breadth to it, covering so much ground. It's perhaps because of Paul's prolific writing, his dedication to spreading the gospel and his tremendous impact on the early church, that in Paul's day, as we saw in Acts, and today, some would like nothing better than to disqualify or discredit Paul. Discrediting the apostle Paul, his conversion, his apostleship, would seriously undercut Scripture. If Paul was not converted as a result of seeing the risen Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, and if he did not receive the gospel by a direct revelation from Jesus Christ, as he said then Paul was a fraud and he was an imposter, calling much of the New Testament then into question as well as key tenets such as salvation by grace through faith. The thing is, as important a figure as Apostle Paul was, we also have the same weight and responsibility of having the truth of our lives match what we say and what we do. The definition of, of credentials is the proof of a person's identity or qualifications. We all show our credentials when we go to the bank to make a deposit or to withdraw money. These days, it, it amazed me. I was at the bank the other day to make a deposit and had to have my li driver's license and it, it's like, I'm giving you money. Why, <laughs> why do I have to show you ID to give you money? But yeah. And of course, that was the day that I'd left my driver's license at home, so I had to go back home and get it. But, and, you know, the star ID is the new thing now. Um, if you're not familiar with that, look that up. It's, you know, it's going to be required for you to take domestic flights now to get the star ID or a passport. I think a passport will work too. But, you know, credentials are, play a very important role in our lives these days. In more and more places, having the proper credentials is becoming a necessity. The qualification you need for salvation is sinner. The credentials needed to enter heaven is forgiven. You receive that credential when you repent and when you receive Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. Once you have that credential, then we should desire to be credentialed for ministry. Credentials for ministry require the right master, a specific office, we might call that a calling, and a clear purpose. Now we're blessed this morning because Paul is going to open up his letter by stating his credentials. And this will give us the opportunity to examine ourselves, not compare ourselves, okay? <laughs> Not compare ourselves. That would be pretty harsh if we were trying to compare ourselves to the Apostle Paul. But we will compare or examine ourselves in the light of what Paul reveals to us about his credentials. So we're going to dig in. Book of Romans. With chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, Paul, 
a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Three things I want you to number. If you write in your Bible, um, if you write in your Bible, if you don't, that's fine. Maybe just make a note in, in something else. The bulletin has a place where you can make notes in it. But if you write in your Bible, I want you to number three things. I want you to put... A number one beside or maybe above where it says in verse one, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. A number two above or beside called to be an apostle. And a number three above or beside separated to the gospel of God. Now we're going to start in a very good spot this morning. We're going to start with item number one a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Now we could spend really all morning on this third part of the verse alone. It's really the foundation of this whole letter. Were Paul not writing based on this starting point, he would not have been able to say, called to be an apostle in the same verse. Nor would he have been able to to write the very last verse in this letter, which says, To God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. We've been been pretty good at at, at getting through the word. But again, we're going to to really kind of put on the brakes here with Romans. Um, We're not going to skid to a full stop, but... But we're going to put on the brakes a little bit, and, and we're, I don't expect us to get very far this morning. But this is very important stuff. Paul's writing to the church of Rome. There would have been those who did not know Paul in that church, so he starts off presenting his credentials. Those in the church of Rome who knew Paul probably held him in very high regard. Yet notice the humility of this first credential. Paul was a bondservant. He was a bondservant of Jesus Christ. This is the Greek word doulos. You might have heard it doulos, same. It's the same, actually, as the Hebrew word, which is in your bulletin if you want to see it, abed. Both meaning a bondservant. Now, a bondservant is defined as one who is devoted to another to the disregard of one's own interests. The term abed or doulos, or bondservant, comes from a ceremony described in the Old Testament. God had given Israel laws presiding over a man who got into debt. That man, the debtor, became the property of the one who was owed the money. In fact, he became a servant to that man. Now we hear that and we think, wow, that's that's pretty, pretty cruel. But consider a few things. First, the debt would be cleared by his service, so it wouldn't be hanging over his head forever. And second, that man did not go the rest of his life um, as a servant. That's because that servanthood had a termination point. It had an end. When the seventh year rolled around, all of the servants were set free. And they could leave their lords if they so chose. Now there were those, however, who lacked the ability to maintain themselves. And so if they were to be made free, they would have been back in the same position they were before. Not able to feed themselves, not able to take care of perhaps even their family they would have had a difficult time getting by. But, you know, under, if they had a kind master or a kind Lord person that they were serving, then they would have been treated very well, almost as if a family member. And so they may have chose, I'd like to remain. I love serving you, and I want to remain serving you. Now, not all of the the keepers or the masters of the lords, not all of them would have been kind. I'm sure there were many who were actually cruel towards those 
that, that were serving them. But there were others who knew the kindness and the love of the Lord, and they reflected those things into the lives of those who were serving them. God provided a bondservant a way to voluntarily become a permanent bondservant to his Lord, to the Lord he loved. Now, the servant had the right to go free, but he chose to remain the servant of his kind Lord. Wherever he went after that, he was then known as a bondservant of his master. And he carried in his body the marks of his servanthood. Exodus 21 Starting with verse 5, it says, But if the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, or to the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Now the Hebrew word for master in Exodus 21 there is adon. It means Lord. It's the same word that the Bible uses to refer to the Lord God of Israel. Now, what is interesting is that like the plural Hebrew word Elohim, you know, when it's, it's Elohim, we find it used, uh, we find the plural word Elohim used in singular verses. Elohim refers to God as a plural. Adonai is the plural form of Adon. And, and we see that as well in singular sentences. We see the Lord referred to as Adonai. And it's a reminder to us of the triune nature of God. Now the use of Adon or Lord in Exodus 21, it, it really brings into focus here a picture. And that picture is the bondservant of those whom Jesus has purchased out of bond servanthood of those who Jesus has purchased out of the debt of sin. One cannot be a bond servant without a Lord. In the case of Paul, his master was Jesus, the one whom Paul devoted himself to out of love. And God gives us a choice of who we devote ourselves to Jesus, who we receive by faith, or sin, which we are born into. Jesus purchased our freedom from sin. But he also left us to choose to follow him or to remain mastered by sin. It's a choice of devotion. That devotion springs from an understanding of just how lost you once were without Jesus. Paul would never forget the deep, deep pit that Jesus had rescued him from. In the final chapters of Acts, we heard Paul recount just who he was before Christ. He was a Pharisee's Pharisee, and he was committed to the destruction of Christians. He hounded Christians from synagogue to synagogue. He rooted them out, and he put them in chains. He even had some put to death. Paul hated Jesus and he hated Jesus' followers. He was an enemy of Christ. Paul was very lost. But Paul's testimony didn't end there. Jesus appeared to him on that road to Damascus, even as he was headed to persecute Christians. And by God's grace, Paul was rescued from the pit he was in. Jesus rescued Paul. This was something that Paul would never forget. We also must not forget because it is an important part of Paul's credentials. And if we forget that, then we will have a hard time understanding this amazing epistle. This is the starting point of Paul's credentials. And a very important one, without which he could not write with any authority the things that are in this letter concerning yielding ourselves as slaves for obedience and whether we yield ourselves to sin leading to death or to obedience leading to righteousness. Had Paul not been a doulos of Christ, but merely an admirer of Christ, we might place aside this letter saying it was written by a man with little integrity. Yet Paul's life was yielded to Christ, 
and he lived out those things that he wrote. The same may be applied to our own lives. How can we point out the way to Jesus with our words if our lives are pointing in another direction? How can we point out the way to Jesus with our words if our words are pointing in another direction? We find in this world two masters. And every one of us serves at least one of them. I should say only one of them. There's God, and then there's Satan. Many people, even Christians, forget that Satan is a created being and that God is infinitely more powerful than him. We also forget that Satan is a real being with evil motives and evil desires. Often we give circumstances that are the result of our own sin the name Satan. And by doing such, we credit Satan with far more ability than he has. God and Satan are not equals. They are not uh, the same in power or in authority. God is supreme and sovereign. And he allows Satan the limited ability to rule until the Lord Jesus comes again. This time, to wrap up history as we know it, those who reject Jesus are by default accepting the rule of Satan. Every single person in this world is a servant either to Satan or to Christ. Jesus told us in Luke 16 that no servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. When Paul was persecuting the church, he was in the service of Satan. Now, this was not something he knew. He didn't bear some external mark. He didn't carry a minion of Satan card. But God says friendship with the world is enmity with God. And God says the carnal or fleshly mind is enmity with God. So like Paul, before he met Jesus, most non-Christians today do not realize that they belong to Satan and are serving him. I know that's, that's strong. That's, this is strong words to use. But we're talking about the eternal destination of people. And that's certainly no light matter. To that point, there are also Christians who have been rescued by Jesus, but they live their lives as if they're still in the bottom of the pit. And if you or I, or I are, are like that, then how can we point anyone to Jesus? It's important not only that we have the right master, but that we are serving that master. Paul served his right master. He was a bondservant of Christ. And so the first credential for ministry is having the right master. Are you, like Paul, a servant of Jesus? You will never be able to serve Jesus until he is your master. Paul was credentialed for ministry not because of who he was, but because of who his Lord is. His Lord is Jesus, and he was the bondservant of Christ. But that alone did not complete Paul's credentials. He also writes in verse 1 that he has a calling. His calling we've designated with a number 2. Paul was called to be an apostle. This was his specific office. There are over 80 occurrences in Paul's letters of the Greek word apostelos. It comes from apostello, which means to send. The title of apostle is used most often to refer to those 12 men, the disciples who were with Jesus um, when Jesus was in his earthly ministry. Those 12 who also went, well, 11, one of, <laughs> one of them, one of them uh, betrayed Jesus and hung himself. But the 11, you know, they went out and they, they 
told people about Jesus, and they, they made disciples and they planted churches. And it's reasonable then to say that, that Paul took the place of Judas among the twelve. Of course, you guys may remember, what about Mattias? You remember uh, in Acts 1, now God didn't tell them to do this, but in Acts 1, the disciples uh, chose a replacement for Judas. They chose Mattias. Now Paul, on the other hand, Paul was committed, commissioned by Christ. That was a point that he actually made in Galatians 1. He said, Paul, speaking of himself, he said, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Now, two very important points that we glean from this are that first, a calling is not given by man. And second, a calling is expressed in maintaining the integrity of the ministry, the integrity of the message, and the integrity of motive. To that first point, Paul had been personally commissioned by Jesus, just as the 11 remaining disciples had been. Now, I'm not saying that a person to whom Jesus has not physically appeared does not have a calling from Jesus on their life, but there does have to be a personal encounter with Jesus. For Paul, that encounter was on the road to Damascus. For other people, it might happen in the car, maybe listening to the radio. Others might have that encounter in a comfy church chair. Still others might have that encounter on the bathroom floor or in detox or in prison. The moment we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have a calling on our lives to serve and to glorify him. An important part of that calling is its order in our life, whether we place other things ahead of that calling. The call, Oswald Chambers said this, he said, the call is the inner motive of having been gripped by God, spoiled for every aim in life, save that of discipling men to Jesus. Kind of a scary picture. You have that man up preaching to you. You're paying attention, aren't you? <laughs> like, uh. Now, <laughs> that can make a calling, that quote, that can make a calling sound kind of ominous, except for the fact that it is a joy to serve the Lord. The bond servant is more free And he's free to serve his Lord instead of be mastered by the world. Not all callings are the same. Many times one calling is preparing you for the next. I remember when I first uh, started attending the little Calvary Chapel, it's not little anymore, but the little Calvary Chapel in Kernersville, North Carolina, and walked in and I think it was the, the next Sunday after I first started attending there. And there was, they were recording the services on, this tells you how long ago it was, but they were, they were using cassette tapes to record. <laughs> um, and, and so they had the, the cassette player there recording the service, and that was my first ministry. I didn't even load the cassettes. My ministry was to hit record. Sometimes I messed up. <laughs> Sometimes I didn't, I didn't do it right and I hit the wrong button. But my job was to, was to hit record. And, and, you know, over time as I became more faithful in doing that, um, God gave me other things to do. All of us should have a specific office, a specific purpose and I'm not talking about, you know, not saying all of us should have an office with a desk and a chair and a computer or anything like that. I mean that each of us should have a place, a responsibility and a duty, something that we, that we concentrate on in our serving. We may have other areas that we, we kind of chip in and help out, 
But there should be a place where we focus our efforts. Paul was called to be an apostle, and he focused his efforts on those things his calling entailed. Now, that does not mean that he didn't help clean the meeting room after the agape feast, but he did not set down being an apostle to do that. We all have differences in calling, differences in where we serve, but we all serve the same Lord. Honor the Lord in all your work and maintain integrity in your service. Paul told the believers in Thessalonica that they were to stand firm and hold fast to the teachings we passed, that we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. And he told the Corinthian church to be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Paul was able to make that statement because he maintained the integrity of of those three things, the ministry, the message, and the motive. The ministry was Paul doing that which he was commissioned by Jesus to do, ministering to the Lord, and by doing that, serving the church well. Ministry that has, an, has integrity is always directed up. You know, we tend to think of ministry as that which we do outward. But that which we do outward should come from that which we do up. There are many church leaders who have this wrong, have it turned around. You know, the ministry is, is toward people, toward man, and that keeps the focus on man. And because the focus is placed on man, there's corruption that ends up introduced and the ministry eventually just degrades into a mess. Those are the kinds of ministries that they have to be propped up. And you'll hear or see them begging for money or turning everything into uh, a ploy to, to get people to give. Now, don't get me wrong. The Bible says we are to give. But a church leader must leave that work to God rather than manipulation Paul also kept the integrity of the message what he taught others to do that's what he did Paul was not perfect but he was above accusation today we find many very popular ministries that have a really really great message except for this little thing over there or this little thing over here but because the majority of the message is sound, Christians are willing to excuse the little corruption that's over here. The little corruption that's in the message. In Matthew 13, Jesus shared a parable in which a woman took leaven. And she added in three measures of meal. Now this is kind of an interesting little picture here. All right, Leaven in scripture is always a picture of sin. Right? And what we might think, if, if we know anything about baking, we might think this, this lady would have taken three measures of meal and added in a little leaven, right? No, she took leaven and she added in the meal, three measures of meal, which is the fellowship offering. They would have recognized this. Today, so let me tell you, the, the meal... The meal didn't change the leaven. The leaven changed the meal. And today we don't have to look too hard to find the integrity of the message compromised by those who dress the message up to look like the world. Add in a, take a, a, a lump of the world, and add in a little bit of righteousness. And think that will justify the means. But that's like, that's like taking a jar of cyanide and adding in a teaspoon of sugar and calling it apple juice. We wouldn't drink that. Yet people will line up, Christians will line up to go see Hollywood movies about the Bible. Bible. 
why are we looking to Hollywood to tell us what the Bible says? You guys know how propaganda works? Yeah, you start getting the people to listen to this message over and over again. It has just a little bit of a lie in it at first. Then the little lie gets a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. And finally, you're all in. What do you think Hollywood's doing? They're poisoning the message. They're taking a big heaping lump of the world. And they're adding in a little bit of, of righteousness, of what appears to be righteousness, dressing it up a little, and we're eating it up. We also find that in, in many popular ministries today, um, one thing that has done a great deal of damage to the church is this idea of relevance. I tell you, it is, and now there are whole magazines that are dedicated to relevance. There's whole websites. Pastors go to these websites. How can I be relevant? And you will find that, hey, you take this, make, make church look a little bit like the world in this way, whatever, and people will come in and they'll, they'll want it, and then you, you, you get them when they least expect it with the gospel. But what kind of Christians is that making? And, and I, I know there's, there's, we all probably have certain teachers that we like to listen to and they have this little thing that's a little bit wrong about it, but hey, the message is, is really good and they're great speakers and they're funny and I like listening to this. Um, surely this little bit of, of thing over here, it shouldn't mess, the, mess up the overall message. And, and so I'm probably stepping on, on toes when I'm talking about this. But, you know, I really... I really hate seeing the gospel message treated as origami. Now remember that when Paul went into the synagogues and reasoned with the people that were there, he was not teaching them from the New Testament. He was showing them the gospel by the Old Testament. God planned the gospel from the beginning. And it hasn't changed. It doesn't change. It will not change. So as Paul wrote to the Galatians, he said, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you, then what you have received, let him be accursed. It's the, the same word there is anathema. Now, notice that Paul didn't say, receive them if a part of their message is good. And that's because the gospel message is only as God says. It's, it's not as what God says and what people kind of like. And it, I know all that it sounds harsh to say these things. But if the message differs in the least from that which the Bible says, then we need to shun the message and the messenger. Now, finally, Paul, he also upheld the integrity of the motive. Now, keep in mind here that we are talking about God's motive. And if the integrity of the motive is to maintain, be maintained... Our motive must be God's motive. So then we have to understand just what motivates God. And we can know the will of the Father, how? Through the work of the Son. Jesus said of his own motivation, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. So we can know the, will, the, the motivation of the Father by the work of the Son. Jesus' motive was to please his Father. That meant dying on the cross in fulfillment of God's plan to reconcile man to himself. 
Jesus' motive was awesome, if I, if I can say so myself. For us to uphold the integrity of the motive, we must agree with what Paul wrote when he said to live as Christ and to die as gain. Integrity of the motive is living for Christ. It's taking delight in being known as a bondservant of the Lord. Now let's draw one more message, one more lesson, I mean, from this before we move on to our designated number three in verse one. By calling himself an apostle, in his letter here to the Romans, Paul reminds his readers that he is writing as no mere ordinary man, but rather as one who has been given a message that should be received as the very word of God. If we are going to profit from our study in this book of Romans, then we must receive it as it truly is. It's not simply a message from Paul to us. Rather, it's a message from God to our hearts and to our minds. This is not an epistle of suggestions. This is God's Word. And we need to take it at its word. We need to obey its teaching. Just as we are obligated to God to obey Him. If we do not do that, then we lack integrity in our motive. So Paul was a bondservant of Christ. So he was serving the right master. Paul was called to be an apostle, and that was his specific office. Paul also had a clear purpose. And this leads us to phrase, the phrase that we designated as number three, separated to the gospel. Now remember with me that when Paul was confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus, Paul was a Pharisee. What is interesting is that the word Pharisee means one who is set apart. And so here in the introduction to Romans, we find that Paul is utilizing a little play on words, saying that he is separated to the gospel. Before Christ, Paul was separated or was set apart from things. But in Christ, Paul was set apart to the gospel. His new purpose in life was to preach the gospel of God. God gives all Christians a new purpose. God calls all Christians to glorify Him in every part of our lives. And remember, whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. It's Colossians 3.17. Now in our, our chapter, Romans 1, verse 3 continues, and it says, Concerning His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. I'll stop there and say, I didn't plan on saying this, but this is so cool. I just got to share it. The word there, declared, in verse 4, the word declared is the Greek word horizo. Horizo. Now, I don't have that to show you on the screen, but uh, H-O-R-I-Z-O, horizo. That is the word for horizon. So why would the word for horizon be used here for declared? Well, I'll tell you. If you've ever, if, well, here's a great example. We're up on a hill here. You know, if you look out off this hill, out into the distance, you're going to see the horizon, right? The horizon is the part where the earth ends and the, the atmosphere begins. It's a clear designated line. We can't deny it. 
we look at that and we go, there's the horizon. There's where the earth, the curvature of the earth continues around, and there's where we see the, the difference between the earth and the atmosphere. And so it's that same thing here. Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection from the dead left no room for doubt. You couldn't look at, at him resurrected and say, he might be the Lord. There's no room to doubt anymore. He resurrected. And so he was declared to be the Son of God. God said, yes, I accept the sacrifice. His crucifixion was important. His death was important. But without the resurrection, those things wouldn't have meant a hill of beans to us. Because the resurrection tells us that, yes, this is the Messiah. It declares to us, as clearly as the end of the earth and the beginning of the atmosphere, it declares to us, as clear as the horizon, that Jesus was the Son of God. Verse 5 continues and it says, Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice how Paul addresses these Roman Christians in, in verse 7. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. In the scripture, the word saints always refers to all of God's people, to all Christians, to all who are born again by the Spirit of God. A saint is not some super Christian. All Christians, according to Paul, are called to be saints, just as he was called to be an apostle. The Greek word for saints that Paul uses is hagios. It means one separated from the world and consecrated to God. Now, interestingly, the Hebrew equivalent of that is mikdash, which means sanctuary. And I'm reminded by that how we've been set apart for worshiping and serving God. And perhaps as, as we close here this morning, we're going to stop here. Perhaps as we close this morning, having talked about Paul's credentials to ministry and hopefully considering also ourselves in the light of those things, perhaps we need to ask, are we living our lives as set apart for worshiping and serving God? If not, what do we need to do to change that? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for opening your word up to us this morning. Lord, there were things in this word that challenged us. There were some pieces that, that you chiseled off in service today that fell to the floor and now we have the choice of either getting up out of the seat and leaving that behind or picking it up and trying to carry it with us. Lord, I pray that we would leave it behind. If you chisel it off, it doesn't belong. Lord, we give ourselves to you. We desire to give ourselves to you as bond servants. We love you. And we want to we want to serve you in in all our life. 
every area, every part, every piece. And Lord, it's hard sometimes. There are things in this world that just cry out to us, try and get our attention. There are unrighteous things that, that want to steal pieces of our heart. And sometimes we give those things our heart. Your word says that you are a jealous God. You love us so much, you can't stand for our eyes to be on anything else that is trying to, anything that's trying to steal our hearts away from you. Father, we ask that whatever that might be in our life, that you would show us that you would say to us that thing that you keep looking at, that thing that you keep doing that has a part of your heart that I want, that belongs to me. Lord, I pray that we would willingly turn our hearts around toward you. Lord, we give you the rest of this morning and we ask that you would give us opportunities to share these things that you have taught us. Lord, that family and friends who don't know Jesus as their Lord and their Savior, co-workers, we ask that you begin to, to tenderize their hearts And give us that opportunity to say, to speak the gospel into their lives, to, to show them Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the food that we're going to eat together here after service. It's your provi provision to us. You have blessed it. Lord, we love you so, so much. Now fear not, little flock. It is the Lord's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face and His light to shine upon you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and smile on you. May He give you His peace his shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and everyone said, Amen.